Can you see that? Yes. Yes. Well, first of all, thank you very much to Beranger and to Ruben for organizing what's been a really fascinating and most helpful uh, two days. And I hope we'll be able to continue with this series in the coming months and years. There are some plus sides to COVID. I'm going to talk about two issues in this contribution. The first is the phasing and terminology of the early Transcaucasian, to use the term as originally coined by Charles Burney, who excavated the two sites in the Ermia Basin around which this discussion revolves, Yannick Tepe and Hachtavan Tepe. And secondly, the difficult matter of chronology. With regard to chronology, I'd very much like to thank Remy Berthon at the Natural History Museum in Paris, who many of you know, of course, for obtaining a small number of new radiocarbon dates for Yannick Tepe, as well as for making a more refined chronological model. So I will use, or at least I will try and use, early Transcaucasian for the region of the Ermia Basin and reserve Kura Araxes for the Southern Caucasus as a whole. I avoid the term Early Bronze Age because as Early Bronze Age is generally understood in Greater Mesopotamia and Anatolia, the Early Bronze Age begins after the so-called Late Uruk Collapse, generally around 3100 BCE. Put simply, the Early Bronze 1, 2, 3 sequence uncomfortably transferred from Europe to the to Tarsus does not readily correlate with any of the pro proposed sequences for the Southern Caucasus. Turning to the early bronze, middle bronze transition, if this is to be placed at the end of Kuraraxis II in the Kuraraxis Valley, then the beginning of the middle bronze age would be positioned in what elsewhere in the ancient Near East is more usually termed EB3 or EB4, with MB starting around or a little before 2000 BC. The Middle Bronze Age in the Ermia Basin seems to me to be less problematic. Its beginning could be equated with Haftavan 6C and at Hasanlu with painted orange ware, following the end of the early Transcaucasian 3. That is, the Middle Bronze Age follows the end of of the Transcaucasian 3 of Haftavan 7 and of the ETC 3 at Yannick, which in the absence of precise evidence can, I think, safely be assumed to have been abandoned at more or less the same time. No less confusing is the geographical term, the Southern Caucasus, alternatively known as the Transcaucasus. Is this to be restricted to greater and lesser Caucasian mountains and the land between, that is between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, or should it include the entire highland massif of eastern Turkey, the Ermia Basin, and the northern end of the Zagros Mountains, stretching down as far as Godin? The Upper Euphrates Valley with the key site of Aslan Tepe, which we heard about earlier, as well as the Amuk Plain and the Levant, are geographically, if not culturally, separate. There are no straightforward answers. And any overall scheme of terminology would need to embrace a good number of geographic and cultural variables. I will restrict my own remarks in what follows to the Ermia Basin, regardless of whether it is an integral part of the Southern Caucasus or tangential to it. And I will focus on two sites in the Ermia Basin excavated by Charles Burney, uh, who you see here with Bridget, Ian Todd and others back in 1962, excavating in what has sometimes been called the fast way of digging, uh, of both Yannick Tepe and Haftavan. And I follow Charles Burney's scheme, according to which the early Transcaucasian can conveniently be divided into three. Here's a map I'm sure you're all familiar with, like Ermia with Yannick Tepe on the east side, half the van up by the northwest corner, Gio Tepe, Giljar quite close to it. And I put on Hassan Lu, which I will refer to very briefly. 
in this scheme, the early transcall case in one is absent from the Urmia Basin and probably also from the Van region. And that is an opinion which is at variance with at least one map that we were shown yesterday, which includes the Urmia Basin and the Van region in the core area. I see no evidence at all to uh, take Kura Araxes one down into the Urmia Basin and the Van region. Early Transcaucasian two was defined by the diaspora or the migration of the bearers of Kura Araxes culture into the Urmia Basin. So it's defined by the arrival of those people rather than by pottery style. The early Transcaucasian three in the Urmia Basin at both Yannick and Haftavan Tepe was characterized by agglutinative rectilinear architecture that replaced the round houses of early Transcaucasia II. At Yannick Tepe, there is some evidence for a hiatus of unknown duration between ETC II and III, and a similar situation might be postulated for Haftavan, but this is uncertain. It is unlikely, but not impossible, that the hiatus in the Yannick stratigraphy might be filled by occupation on some unexcavated portion of the mound or in its near vicinity. So it's really unclear whether there is really a, a gap in time and the settlement just shifting around or whether there really is a break. During the excavation of Yannick, Bernie recognized that there were changes in pottery style with the sharp demise of patterning and differences in the repertoire of shapes occurring well before the end of the roundhouse phase. Now, I've, I've said this before, it's in the uh, 2014 Paleo Orient article, that the big change in the pottery comes before the big change in the architecture by some way, at, at least the absolute minimum, uh, two phases of roundhouses with the with the plain pottery. My analysis for the publication, which I hope will, of the pottery and the other finds and so on, which I hope will be out very early next year. My analysis shows that this change was surprisingly abrupt. Although here again, it is possible that excavation elsewhere on the mound might reveal a more transitional phase, but it seems to be very abrupt. So I have divided the early Transcaucasian two at Yannick Tepe into A and B, with clear continuity, very strong continuity in the ceramics from, uh, from B into ETC3, despite the apparent hiatus in the stratigraphy. And here just to remind you of ETC2 with the uh, the round houses with uh, the waffle and door roofs, the doors high up in the wall, stepping down into uh, divided spaces. And you see on the bottom left, one of the many built in kitchen ranges with ovens and halves and uh, plaster trays, presumably for rolling out bread and storage and so forth and so on. There are two points that stand out. The earliest early transport case in at Yannick Tepe arrived fully developed in terms of building techniques, that is round houses with mud brick walls, wattle and daub roofs, and these elaborate kitchens. And with its ceramic repertoire and its uh, range of motifs already fully developed. Secondly, there is no known site to the north in the Kuraraxis Valley or even to the northeast that appears to be immediately antecedent to either of these traits in material culture. So where, where they came from remains a mystery. Defining the earliest early Transcaucasian occupation in the Urmia Basin as early Transcaucasian II does not necessarily imply that this period did not start somewhat earlier elsewhere. However, the view from Armenia 
uh, and of course Rubin's excellent work there, uh, shows that there's a clear break between Kura Araxes I and Kura Araxes II, which he dates fairly firmly to around 2900 BCE. There is no cultural break or change detectable at that time in the Urmia Basin. Thus, the sequence in Armenia does nothing to help in determining precisely where the elite or when the antecedents of Yannick Tepe might have come or where they might have come from. Furthermore, there are no close parallels to the patterning of the Yannick Tepe pottery in Armenia. Intensive recent work in the Araxes Valley, immediately to the north of Yannick Tepe, has not produced anything that appears to be a direct precursor. So the question of origins of Yannick, and also, as we've seen from Godin Tepe, remains unresolved. But my subject today, of course, is not the beginning of the early Transcaucasian in the Ermia Basin, but the end. So, Thanks to the Natural History Museum in Paris and uh, to Remy, we have uh, three new carbon dates for the early Transcaucasian, five in all. One comes from uh, period 2B and two from period 2A. These dates do not help very much with the start of the early Transcaucasian, but they would appear to indicate a start not much later than 3,100 uh, for the beginning and could be used to argue for a uh, slightly earlier date. I'm not going to show you the, the dates in, in detail. These new dates and the new model that incorporates also the earlier radiocarbon dates do have the effect of raising the date of the ETC to AB boundary as well as the ETC to 3 boundary. This brings the end of Yannick Tepe at somewhere around uh, 2B, at uh, somewhere around 2,600, maybe 2,500, uh, which is a, a date much more in keeping with what has generally been seen as the end of Kura Araxes II in the Southern Caucasus, as we've seen in almost all the presentations yesterday and today. We've also fits quite nicely with the end of Godin IV in the central Zagros. So there you see them. Uh, I, perhaps it would be, best be categorized as an educated guess for the chronological sequence at Yannick, 3,100 to 2,800 for uh, the patterned pottery and the round houses, the plain pottery perhaps for another two centuries after that, and a, a, a gap of 50 years, but that's really a guess, down to about 2,200. I'll come down to that later date and back to that later date in a moment. Uh, to remind ourselves what we're talking about, we've just seen some of the circular huts, but this is the ETC3 with the rectilinear architecture where these uh, square buildings with central mud brick piers uh, staircases or ladders coming down from the roof, the same complex uh, built-in kitchen fittings as we've seen in the roundhouses and so forth. And here uh, a photograph from the 1960s, one of the few colour photographs that have survived. And you can see in the same way that the roundhouses tend to, tended to be rebuilt one on top of another. So with these agglutinative buildings, and you can see in the middle ground here, the different phases of, of walling one on top of the other. You can see the built-in uh, central mud brick piers rather than timber posts and so forth and so on. So the point I really want to make is that there is enormous continuity between the round houses and the rectilinear architecture. At first sight, they seem to be very different. But if you look at the uh, individual features, the shape is different and the rectangular buildings have upper floors, or at least some of them. But otherwise, they're surprisingly similar. The floor areas of the huts and the larger rooms are more or less the same. They have 
central supports, wooden posts or mud brick piers. They're both entered by climbing down from uh, the roof in the case of the rectangular architecture, but from clambering over what seem to be storage bins and so on and stepping down into the round houses. They have the same kitchens and they have pretty much the same sort of um, storage in bins or on the roofs with the animals in both cases apparently kept right off the site. So there is very strong continuity between the later round houses and the agglutinative rectilinear architecture, uh, despite the <coughs> obvious visual difference. So I want now to turn to the main theme, which is the end of the early Transcaucasian. And as I said a moment ago, it doesn't seem to be unreasonable to assume that the rectilinear architecture at both sites is more or less contemporaneous. And this would make BETC3 more or less the same as Godin 3, which as Mitchell uh, reaffirmed earlier today, uh, doesn't seem to bear, bear very much relationship to Kura Araxes or early Transcaucasian. At the end of the period, at both Yannick and Haftaban, the sites appear to have been peacefully abandoned with no sign of destruction. Yannick is not reoccupied until the, end, until the later Kibanid period. Thus, any attempt at assessing the date of the abandonment rests on Haftaban, where in level 6C, there was reoccupation after an interval of unknown duration. The transition from seven, that is from the early Transcaucasian three to 6C, the earliest Middle Bronze Age at Haftaban, was represented by the eroded stubs of mud brick walls. Michael Edwards, who did his doctoral dissertation on it and published it a good number of years ago now, was doubtless correct in thinking that there were standing wall stubs visible when the first half of the sixth settlement was established on the summit of the mound. <coughs> of course, we can do no more than guess the length of the interval, nor can we be certain that the earliest levels of half of six C were on the summit, although that is perhaps likely from what is known of the mound as a whole. It is unfortunate that the early half of an six pottery excavated in the last 1979 season has never been fully studied. Edward's study of Haftaban 6 focused on the 6B material and its context, which was really all that was available to him in the tumultuous circumstances of 1979 and 1980 when his thesis was being written. It would seem, with all due caution, that the early Haftavan six pottery was closely related to painted orange ware. That in itself might not cause any great surprise. Whether it represents the start of painted orange ware or whether the painted orange ware known from uh, Hassan Lu and neighboring sites was already fully developed when it appeared at Haftavan, we simply don't know. The sequence, however, seems clear. As a working hypothesis, I would suggest, one, that the early Transcaucasian three village on the summit of Haftavan was abandoned at about the same time that Yannick Tepe was abandoned. Two, that those abandonments mark the end of the early Transcaucasian in the Ermia Basin. And three, that the next occupation, characterized by the earliest painted pottery, marks the start of the Middle Bronze Age. In his doctoral thesis, Michael Edwards obtained a few archaeomagnetic dates for Haftaban, and they placed the start of 6C of the earliest painted pottery at around 2200, a date that was accepted by Charles Burney in his introduction to the monograph on Haftaban 6. Looking further to the west, as far as I know, 
no Haftavad Six C or painted orangeware ceramics have been found in the region around Lake Van, where the earliest Middle Bronze Age pottery, uh, so well studied by Arno Osferat, if I understand correctly, is reminiscent of Haftavan 6b and 6a. So there seems to be a, a chronological difference between what is happening in the Van region and the Ermia Basin, but that may well be a gap in our archaeological knowledge rather than a real gap. It's long been clear that the early Transcaucasian pottery traditions in the Ermia Basin are divided between east and, east and west, and Catherine Marot showed us uh, that difference on one of her maps uh, before lunch. On the east side, we have the tradition of impressing and incising and filling with white paste that extends from Yannick Tepe all the way down south, all, way off this map uh, to Godin. Well, the pottery uh, from these sites <coughs> is clearly related by both shape and methods of patterning or technology. The repertoire of motifs at the two sites are very different. Furthermore, the buildings of Godin Four are a mixture of round and rectangular. You don't have the, the same pattern of circular huts and so on as we see at Gannon. On the west side of the lake, we have Haftaban 8, early Transcaucasian 2, which is floating. We don't know what's underneath it or above it, with round huts and groove and dimple pottery, clearly akin to nearby Geotepe, Gilja, and Hassan Lu. And this westerly fashion seems to man manifest itself also further west in the Van region, although there some poor incision is also found. If the excavated roundhouses at Haftavan are floating in time, and nothing is known of the levels above or below them, we do have the very small but extremely deep sounding at Giljar and Bertha Brown's earlier excavations at Geotepe, both of which demonstrate the rarity of incised and white filled patterning on pottery from the western side of the lake. Thus, there is a dichotomy between, on the one hand, the regionalization of pottery on the eastern and western sides of Lake Ermia, and on the other hand, the parallel sequence of ETC2 roundhouses, followed by ETC3 rectilinear architecture at both Yannick and Haftaban. Yotepi is unclear, and the sounding at Gilja too small for certainty. Catherine Marot this morning touched on uh climatic change in environment i'd like to say a few more words about it in my 2014 paleo orient paper i suggested that the etc 23 boundary at yannick and at haftaban might be equated with what is often thought to be a global uh, climatic event known as the k4.2 BP rapid climate event. And here I just show you one of the, uh, the many uh, examples of studies by paleoclimatologists which attempt to show the, the way in which this climatic event really does seem to have been global. The new chronological model for Yannick Tepe, based on a combination of all the new radiocarbon dates and stratigraphy, demonstrates that my proposal was clearly wrong. However, lowering the date of the end of the early Transcaucasian three, suggested by this new model, as well as by the archaeomagnetic dates, might indicate that the cave 4.2 event was responsible for the end of early Transcaucasian three in the Ermia Basin and beyond. Tony Sagona gave a date of approximately 2,200 for the end of the early Bronze Age or Kuraraxes at Soshurt up on the Erzurum Plain. This is not, however, a straightforward issue. Firstly, the K.4.2 event 
is not to be understood as an event in uh, the sense of the eruption of Vesuvius or of Thera. It's an event for paleoclimatologists because it happens relatively quickly in the tens or hundreds of thousands of years that they look at. But for archaeologists, it takes place over longer periods of time. And it might be much more helpful to think of it in archaeological terms as a trend rather than an event. Therefore, even if this change in climate is to be seen as one major factor, it would not have been immediate and different settlements will have been affected to different degrees over varying lengths of time. On the other hand, both Yannick and Haftavan appear to have been abandoned rather suddenly, rather than declining slowly, as though some unknown factor caused the villagers to pack up and to leave. If climatic change was a significant, significant explanatory factor, with swift, swift impact on lake levels, snowfall, spring melts, rainfall, and the abundance of water for irrigation, as well as for flocks and herds. One could imagine critical impact on mixed farming villages over a short span of time, followed by a period of sparse occupation until such a time as conditions for permanent agricultural settlement returned in the Middle Bronze Age. The validity or otherwise of these suggestions will rest on future research by environmentalists together with much more refined radiocarbon sequences for both northwestern Iran and the Van region. So to come to a conclusion, in the Kura of Araxes Valley, Kura Araxes II develops into different cultures in the following periods, as we've heard much about in the last two days, typified by Kurgan burials that indicate more developed social stratification with rich and more powerful elites buried in large and prominent barrows, marking wealth as, long, as well as a new burial tradition. Almost nothing is known about their settlements, perhaps because of mobility and frequent shifting, and perhaps also because they were largely constructed of wood rather than mud brick, as might be suggested by the carpentry skills that we see in some of the larger Kurgans. The ceramics, as we've seen, show much continuity from Kura Araxes too. And this Kurgan tradition, generally thought to be introduced from the north, possibly associated with an influx of new people. I'm reluctant to term it Middle Bronze Age, given the more general start of the MBA to the south. If a general shorthand is required for the entire region, regardless of the more local cultural labels, perhaps Kura Araxes III or ED III might be more appropriate, but that would also raise the awkward question of when does ED III MB, when does that transition happen? I'm glad that this is not my problem. It's not my problem because in the Omea Basin and the Van region, as I suggested, we've seen that Yannick and Haftavan and other excavated sites, the early transcaucasian continued until after abandonment, it was replaced by new cultural traditions characterized by painted pottery. Almost nothing is known about painted orangeware settlements and whether they represent some kind of population replacement. In the Van region, the, the situation is yet more unhappy, with early Transcaucasian sites being abandoned and no good evidence of settlement until the presence of Yaila Ware or Van Ermia Ware. No excavated site in the Van region has provided evidence of the relationship between the last early Transcaucasian and the appear appearance of Ermia Ware. And Ina Osferat has demonstrated that the distribution of sites in the two periods is completely different. I will end with a plea to the young and enthusiastic generation of archaeologists working now 
in northwestern Iran. Please go back to Yannick, go back to Haftavan, and spend a short time cleaning up some of the old uh, sections, cleaning up the old trenches, and extract sufficient example, samples for a comprehensive set of carbon-14 dates clearly stratified from each of the major periods and stratigraphic levels to complement those now becoming available from further north. Then we will all be able to turn our attention to the more interesting problems of culture, social dynamics, economies and environment without always having to discuss chronology. Thank you.